Uh, no, no, Madam Clerk, maybe we have a roll call. Chairman Hill? Here. Vice Chair Soko? Here. Director Alvado? Here. Director Banks? Here. Director Carruth? Here. Director Chung? Here. Director Hubbard? Director Hack? Here. Director Martinez? Director Ming? Director Monaghan? Director Reardon? Here. Director Shea? Yes. Director Spitzer? Here. Brian Chamberlain? Here. You do have a form. Thank you. Public comments, Madam <coughs> Clerk. Oh, we have no response, Steve. Thank you. We will move on to the consent calendar, items one through nine. All matters listed under the consent calendar are considered routine, will be enacted by one vote. There will be no discussion of these items unless board members request specific items be removed from the consent calendar for separate actions. Do we have any board members that would like to remove an item from the consent calendar? Item number four. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, registering a no on six. Any further? All right, appropriate for a motion. Second. Right, it's been moved that the consent calendar be approved with the exception of item number four and registering a no vote for director Mr. on item number Six. Mr. Joseph, can I still move it and still vote no on one? Certainly. Okay. Yes. All right. There's a motion on the floor. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Everybody opposed? Thank you. Item number four. Director Bates. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, staff for <clears throat> the manner in which they present the report now on a lot of the contracts that we do have. A uh, couple, I think it was last year, we talked about uh, a review of the CAPS manual so that uh, the need to rebid after a number of years might be discussed in more detail. I just like to put that back on uh, our work plan that uh, a couple of these contracts are pretty old. Many are justified because they are, uh, they are proprietary, a lot of the IT, but uh, some of the others we ought to uh, really have some, I think, evidence that in fact that is the best price. And we're hearing that is, but uh, without doing an RFP or at least talking about why we're not uh, would be helpful as we go forward. So I'm just kind of reminding us that we were going to do that and when we uh, do our review uh, as we come into the new uh, budget year that we take a look at that. With that, I'll move it. Second. It's been moved and seconded, item number four. Any further comments from any directors? All, please vote. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. We will now move to board item 10. I think we have a staff report. Question? Good morning. We can hear you. <laughs> Gretchen Lindelof, Acting Controller. Uh, the audited financial statements for the year ended June 30th, 2013 are in Report 10 in your board package. And today I would like to introduce Adam Henderson from KPMG, who is here to present the Auditor Required Communications. Good morning. Um, I would like to turn your attention to page one of the audited financials. That's where our opinion is included. And for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2013, we issued an unmodified opinion on the financial statements. A couple things I'd like to point out to you. In our opinion, we have two things that need to be communicated to the board. One is management's responsibility. So management with the oversight of the board is responsible for the fair for the preparation and fair presentation of the financial statements in accordance with US generally accepted accounting principles. The auditor's responsibility is to express an opinion on those financial statements. Now this also includes management is responsible for the design, implementation, and maintenance of internal control over the preparation and presentation of the financial statements. As part of our audit, we also consider internal controls and 
whether they're designed and implemented and maintained. However, we do not express an opinion over internal control specifically. Now, as part of our audit, if we did find any control deficiencies, we would need to report those to the board and make them aware. As part of our audit, we did not find any deficiencies in internal control. As part of our audit, we also assess management's accounting policies, practices, significant judgments, and if any of those would deviate from US generally accepted accounting principles, we would note that to the board. As part of our audit, we did not have any instances that we needed to report to the board. Um, we're also required to report any uncorrected or corrected misstatements related to the financial statements. We did not have any uncorrected or corrected misstatements in the audit for the fiscal year ended 2013. We are also required to report to you any disagreements with management that we had during the audit. We didn't have any disagreements with management. We're also required to report to you if management consulted with any other accountants and management did not consult with any other accountants during the year. We're also required to communicate to you any significant issues or difficulties encountered by us in performance of our audit. We did not have any significant issues or difficulties in performance of our audit. And lastly, we are required to report to our independence that we are independent of San Joaquin Hills and we are independent. Um, I would like to open up for any questions that you may have. Do any board members, directors have questions for our I think you gave an excellent report. All right, thank you. All right. Uh, the desired action here is to give me some help. Okay. Approve. All right. Is there a motion to approve? I move. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you very much. We will now move on to item number 11. Kelsey. Good morning. Kelsey Anderson, Porter Manager of Design. Uh, this morning I'm here to present an item for an amendment to the All Electronic Tolling Service Engineering Services contract in the amount of $11,119 for this agency. In November 2011, the Board of Directors authorized staff to award HDR Engineering the contract for civil design services in support of all electronic tolling. The scope of this contract included design preparation and of construction documents and Caltrans encroachment permitting needed for the civil work associated with the AET project. The original scope of work has been completed by HDR and this amendment is to perform additional design services, construction plan preparation, and coordinate permit update for the AET alternative on-road on signing plank. Uh, on-road signing is important, an important component to inform drivers on any facility. For the AET conversion in particular, the on-road signing, signing is critical to alert drivers to the conversion and communicate acceptable methods of payment. The sign working group has convened to develop an alternative for the on-road signing concept that's already been approved by Caltrans to have a more customer-focused sign message. The revisions to the on-road signing concept have been finalized and are ready for final design and incorporation into the construction plans once we receive final concurrence from Caltrans. Staff recommends the approval of this contract amendment for HDR, um, and this amount can be accommodated in the FY14 all electronic tolling budget. That concludes my presentation, and I can answer any questions. Yes. When will we have an opportunity to uh, view these signs, the designs, and so forth? Or will we have before they are? Um, today at, at during the AET update, so um, present the, the new sign. We gave a full presentation to the Toll Operations Committee yesterday, and we will do it again in a few minutes. Any further questions? Just one question, Ryan. Um, Caltrans, we're okay with you guys on this? Yeah. Good. We're going to approve the sign. Well, I'm just, I'm asking for there are, there are no issues, any objections. There are no issues with us having concerns with this. I'm sorry? Okay, the department doesn't have any issues with this item. Okay, that's right. Yeah. Oh, I 
it's technically just true. Yeah. But I was in that community yesterday. I just want to make sure I didn't misunderstand. We talk a lot about the science, and you still have Sacramento. You still have certain procedures where they encounter and it's still going through a review process. Certainly. That's, that's technically correct. Yeah. We don't anticipate any issues. We don't anticipate it, but it's not approved at this time. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Further questions? Motion for approval, please. I move. Second. I move the second. All, right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Thank you very much. We'll move on to the Chief Executive Officer's report. Okay. Two items, Mr. Chairman. One is um, giving an update on the 40573 issue. Uh, Dave. Good morning. I'd like to bring you up to date on the 40573 connector and the um, project that OCTA is working on on the 405 uh, north of the 73. If you could go to the next slide. Um, the green highlights the 405 project that OCTA is currently working on. Uh, and it shows the relationship between that project and our project on the 73. Uh, next slide. Here are some of the alternatives that uh, are being under, are under evaluation by OCTA. Alternative one adds a, a general purpose lane in each direction. Alternative two adds two general purpose lanes in each direction. Alternative three adds a general purpose lane in each direction, plus it takes the HOB lane and converts it into two express lanes. Uh, and then the concept A uh, basically has a single express lane plus two, uh, uh, two general purpose lanes in some locations. Next slide. Uh, while, while this agency is not taking a position on either of those alternatives, we would like to see a connector to the median of the 405 directly from the 73, and that's our goal as an agency is to try to get that implemented as part of the 405 improvement project. <coughs> um, this slide shows you some of the revenue impacts on the San Joaquin Hills system for some of these alternatives. We did not evaluate all the alternatives, but if you look at the alternative three dual express lane with the 40573 connector, uh, in 2020, we anticipated a 4.7% increase over a no-build project. Um, and the, that equates to about $8 million in revenue or in annually, or about 5,100 trips per day additional on our system because of this connector and the Alternative 3 um, project. Next slide. So at the OC, two OCTA board meetings, or one OCTA board meeting and a regional planning and highways committee meeting last week, a significant discussion on all the different alternatives, and the decision was made to postpone any further discussion until December 9th at the OCTA board meeting. Uh, subsequently, there will be a number of different meetings with Caltrans and OCTA and TCA, and a number of the different cities, some outreach to the cities and things like that. But our next steps will be to continue to message the um, importance of that 40573 interchange and some of the other things that you see here. Um, we will be participating with Caltrans and OCT in the management lanes discussions as we have been. And then um, continue working with OCTA to try to get uh, the 40573 connector into the I-405 improvement project. And with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Okay. Um, I would make a comment before I asked for questions that um, I certainly have an appreciation for Director Spitzer's action that allowed us to really be at the table for these discussions and I appreciate that and I thank you for that. Uh, do any of the directors have any questions? Uh, I have a question regarding the vending plan. Uh, Dave uh, uh, the cost of this was mentioned at a meeting at about 40 million dollars. don't have to answer that now but I think a vending plan as part of this needs to be discussed because I continue to raise the issue regarding whether we had a real stress test, I don't know if I'm using the correct terminology on the financial implications to the 73 and where that additional funding comes from. And we know that working with Caltrans, we're talking about some sort of shared revenue uh, from the toll lanes that would certainly be something we'd have to consider regarding the 73 connector if it's going to actually cost that much. Is it added to uh, OCTA and alternative number three costs, or is that something that we are going to share? I know you don't have the answers now, but 
what's happened with this all along the way. There's new information that we have to react to so quickly without any real background. And I, I would also like to see the studies that were done on how we are projecting that increased revenue over time because it's still an issue, I think, especially northbound from South County, that you are going to get in <clears throat> toll lanes all the way from, let's say, Laguna Hills, Laguna Niguel, to the northerly most point on the 405, and, and that's <coughs> going to be expensive. And so there needs to be something that actually addresses that with the commuters. Where will you start your trip? Uh, and does that impact the 73? And not to include that as we go forward, because selecting one of the alternatives still remains a big issue at OCT, as you well know. They're probably in the audience every time, so you know. But I, 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 I'm just hammering away at this so we don't get surprises, which we continue to get, and then everything goes south, and things get delayed. And uh, we need the 405 improvement, we certainly need uh, many of the Mobility 21 or M2020 plans that we have. And every time there's a new component or something that hasn't been adequately addressed and educated, the public educated, we get these hiccups. And now they're becoming obstacles. So please, uh, again, get us some real solid information regarding the funding plan and what the impact to the 73 could be with the actual cost of the toll that runs the length of, you know, the whole, the entire express lane if those come to be. Mm -hmm. Well, the, um, if I could respond, uh, Mr. Chair and, and uh, Director Bates, um, if you go back to the slide that has the uh, table, these, these are the forecasted um, revenue impacts to the San Joaquin system, but it doesn't include obviously any cost for the 405 73 connector. We're assuming that's being done along with the 405 improvement project. Um, and alternatively, the, for, for instance, alternative one is only a single general purpose lane and does not have a direct connector to the median of the 405. Um, but still, that's a positive uh, impact to the 73 revenue, only because the expansion of the 405 uh, is, it makes that trip more attractive. Um, so either one has a positive impact on the 73 revenues. You can see the difference between the alternative three and alternative three A really shows you the difference between uh, what a connector does and what a, connect, a project without a connector does. So uh, and about another 2% in additional revenue on the 73 with a direct connector. Isn't that based on uh, conjecture, Dave, that because you're going to have additional uh, cars traveling or throughput, that those people, we just have more traffic? Therefore, you're using, I think, a formula that multiplies that by what the toll would be. But that does not mean that we're going to have more traffic if people make a choice to get off. And that's what we don't have in terms of where we got these numbers. Well, these numbers come from, from, from our um, traffic and revenue consultant, Stan Peck, who is also working on the 405 project. Did they do a financial uh, assessment or a stress test of any kind? They, they did the modeling for these two model years for the various different alternatives, well, and that's how they came up with these percentages. Well, I'm still a doubting person, so I'd like to see uh, those numbers and, and what, how they actually determine who's going to choose to to take a $15 trip versus a $25 trip, okay? Thank you. Can I follow up on that a little bit? I mean, that's how I think some of it's going to be so wonkish because we've been doing, we've, been, we've read some of our studies for years. I, I actually think they're kind of fascinating um, in a weird sort of way. So I know kind of weird, we've become kind of weird in that regard. So, I, but it also is why we know a lot about this business inside. I think why we've been conversant on the 405 because we're not new to this whole discussion of toll roads. So two points, where is the Stantec modeling and why hasn't it? Have we, have we not? I, I don't think I've seen it. I mean, I think that's what we're saying. Isn't, isn't well, actually, it? these are the results of it, and we were we were to present this back in October, uh, but as you as you recall, that uh, meeting got postponed because of lack of forms. No, but this is these are conclusions. That's not. I want to see like what I like to read 
<laughs> or the assumption, because okay. the methodology. Yeah, and we can get that from Stan Yeah, that's, I mean, I think that's what, get, I think that's, I think that's what Director Bates is saying. Where are the, where's the meat and potatoes and guts of that okay. methodology so we can understand how you reach these conclusions? Sure. The other thing is, is that <clears throat> I know, colleagues, that no one wants to jump into the fire, uh, to the frying pan, you know, without, if you don't need to. But one of the big problems we're having, I think, at OCT in this discussion is it's, it's being framed as OCTA versus the corridor cities that are affected by the 405 project. And I'll just tell you, Mr. Chairman, if this agency is lobbying for and thinks it would have a financial benefit to the system, then this agency needs to take a position on the project. And I don't think you get a pass. I don't think you do, Neil. I, I think that if you want something, and you're coming to an agency like OCTA and you're saying, hey, decision makers, if this could, this could be a financial accruing benefit to the TCA and it makes sense to have a regional system, then the board doesn't get to take a pass on whether or not you think that's an important project. That, why do we have to do the heavy lifting at OCTA to then provide a direct connect that might benefit the San Joaquin Hills and the revenue projections in the future? Why, aren't, why, is not, why isn't this agency weighing in on that project? Why are you silent on it? That's a, I guess it's a question for you, Mr. Peterson. I mean, why, 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 why would this agency be silent? If you're doing, if you're making an ask. Right. My understanding uh, is that the board has taken a strong position on whatever decision OCTA makes. There should be a connection between whatever is in the median to the 73. You've been clear on that, and that was transmitted, and you had an effect on policy because. All the options, if I understand it correctly, the sense of where OCTA is going, the 73 connection issue has sort of been tentatively agreed to. I mean, there's not a big argument on that at this point. So you've had an impact. Uh, I think what you're asking, though, is above and beyond that, what's our position on option three versus option one and that type of thing? What I'm saying is, for the record, to be straight, this agency was a little shy about how it transmitted the direct connect. When you got here, I think you were a little surprised that it was a it was like a kind of an innocuous transmittal. We actually raised the point, how come it wasn't elevated? Why didn't staff testify? Why didn't you really make it clear on the record that you wanted direct connect? I, I thought you agreed at the time it was a little bit reserved and no, it needed to be Mr. more- Chairman, I already you know, you. talked about. Yeah, no, no, I get that. But I'm saying is, is that why, are, why is the OCTA board taking all the flack? In other words, why aren't, if, 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 if there's a better alternative, <coughs> like alternative three, that makes sense for the region and interconnectivity between the San Joaquin, which has had serious financial issues, and if there's a revenue opportunity and potential that could accrue to the benefit of paying off the bondholders and improving the liquidity, that's, I think, an important issue for this board. Now, OCTA wants to make a decision sooner rather than later, but I will tell you the decision, there's going to be plenty of opportunities to weigh in. And um, I don't know how my colleagues feel about it. I mean, my gut tells me it's they'd rather not weigh in because it's so controversial. But at the same time, I honestly feel that this agency and these elected officials need to at least opine about whether or not this interconnectivity is important. Director Spitzer, the reason, by my definition, the board did not weigh in is because the board did not have a clear majority of support for any of the particular. We didn't. We did board. not. So you decided it would be better not to bring it. And, and so if you remember, the letter that was sent and my testimony was built in the camel process it, you know it had something in it for everyone uh, in order to get through the process <coughs> and, and but the theme that was very strong thanks to you allowing us to get to the table or supporting us to get to the table was that a connector need be part of any decision that is made well, I appreciate it, Mr. Chairman, but I will tell you, it's, it's really Supervisor Bates that had the most influence on me because she made it unequivocally clear and in her advocacy for whatever, you can't make a decision in a vacuum and you really need to know what the financial impacts would be. And I, and unfortunately, well, you heard her say that she has still some reservations <coughs> and I think it is really important because some of us are going to continue, have to vote and have to continue this debate about what alternative we might select at OCTA. I think we, I'm a complete advocate of interconnectivity. You have to be, you're going to have a system. You have to have 
interconnectivity, but you can't do it to the detriment of finances. It looks like that's been preliminarily answered to the positive. It's, they're not huge numbers, but it's to the positive. But this issue of who's gonna pay for it, if there's cost sharing and things like that, what what's the timeline on that? Is that something, where, where are we at in those discussions? Are you waiting to see what OCTA does in terms of alternative first? No, no, I think Director uh, Bates has, has, has suggested that we should do is sort of the next step. Number one, we ought to come back with you with the assumptions that are in that back up these numbers. Get Stan Tech here so you can hear. Because if I hear your question correctly, you're saying, you question whether somebody coming from the south on I-5 is gonna spend 25 bucks to get to the Orange County line as opposed to 15 to get to Irvine. You're just wondering, so you want to understand the elasticity and how many people would actually do that? Right. So I, I get that. Well, part of that would be whether or not there was a bailout point. If I get on the 73 uh, off of the 5 in Capistrano, and I can't get out of that toll system until I get to the 605, mm -hmm. then there might be some degradation of ridership because of that. And is that included in this calculation? Yeah. It is. Or is there a bailout point <laughs> that I can still take the 73, still have the free section transition smoothly onto the 405, but before the next toll is taken, I have the opportunity of getting out of the system. And those are elements that will, will directly impact these numbers. But the question is, what if any of those assumptions have been entered into these numbers at this point in time? So if we could reschedule that, we would do that. All right, are there any other questions? Just, can we can just I, add? Can I add one more point? Yes, please. Uh, can, I think where Director Spitzer's going on this is, Dave's presentation does not talk about the real value of this, in my opinion, is beyond the connector and the numbers you're seeing here. If, in fact, we want to have a regional system going forward, the idea of the potential of using the 73 as the extension of the express lanes, if you will, going south on the 405 to dramatically move people over the 73 as, in effect, the HOV, HOT, <coughs> express lanes, whatever you want to call it on the 405, to use the 73 for that purpose, the value of that is not in these numbers. And that, so, I mean, the potential here for doing a regional system where we're part of the equation uh, cannot happen without the connection. Right. So there's the real value. Well, I mean, it to your provides point, the flexibility. Well, to your point, <laughs> the value of the TCAs has been undervalued vis-a-vis -vis it wasn't included in the analysis on the degradation study. Correct. Which, 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 and Caltrans, to their credit, came here and said, yes, our conclusions may have been different if we had included the TCA network is, is part of the degradation analysis. It wouldn't affect this corridor on the 405, but it could affect the northeast part of Orange County. So that's, I think we're all pushing that. I mean, it's about making this an integrated network and understanding that all these decisions should be done on a regional basis, not as a standalone agency, but all working together to integrate these systems, which I think everybody has been pushing for. I think especially you, Mr. Peterson, I think you made that unequivocally clear. So yeah. um, if we could, I would like, I don't know, I'm sure Director Bates as well, I would like to see this Antec as soon as possible mm -hmm. because it's important for me as a OCTA member to understand pushing for this too at OCTA. And I really want to understand the methodology because we haven't concluded whether there's going to be uh, ability to get in and out at certain points uh, on under alternative three. And clearly that, that does make a huge difference about people's choices to continue on to this uh, 73. So given your time and your meetings on the 6th of December, I believe. Mm -hmm. Nine. Mm -hmm. Nine. So do you want to have a special committee meeting between now and then or do you want to have individual briefings? I'd just like to see the data and then we can figure it out from there. Is that okay with you? Oh, sure. I, I would just like to uh, give a little uh, history of my deep concern. I was chairing the 73 back when we had high hopes uh, of uh, the toll road and what it meant to uh, South Orange County in particular and our mobility uh, north and south. And the studies, granted, there's been a lot of criticism of the manner in which those were done, but they didn't match up to, the revenue generation didn't match up to what they projected in traffic. And the El Toro uh, improvements happened uh, shortly after the opening of that road. So the 73 has suffered 
uh, the entire time is a very fragile bottom line. When we start talking about this some years later, when we're still in that very difficult uh, fragility with our revenues on that uh, toll road, to bring something like this forward and impact that even if it's a short time until people get used to it, five years, I mean, it could undo what we just did, what, a year and a half ago, and the refinancing and where we're going with that. So it's not a, you know, just a simple matter. It, it is a critical matter to the financial stability of the 73. And I don't want us to forget that. I'm very open and I hope it's good news but we can't ignore it at this very critical juncture when we're making those kind of decisions. And we shouldn't, especially when you're talking about who's gonna pay for the connector. Coming out of the toll from the 73, and we've got, you know, that's very tightly determined uh, over how many years that we will have uh, the revenues to meet our debt service. And we had, you know, a, a very, um, I guess, generous reduction in that debt service requirement. Those are, those are all little pieces that coming together can be very significant in impacting financially this road. So I don't think we should just you know jump on board with you know the cheerleaders. Oh God, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. We're going to have a regional system. Uh, yeah, but it's going to cost a lot, and we better understand now how we get there. And, and those are the issues uh, at OCTA. To have two general purpose lanes is $100 million additional dollars. Because of that, it was not a choice at OCTA because of the cost. We're talking about $40 million, almost 50% addition to connect to the 73 with no discussion of where that money comes from. Yet we were told we couldn't find $100 million for two general purpose lanes, which is what the corridor cities want. And there's other issues with regards to does that make sense. But you know, it has to be done. If we're going to have a regional system, then we have to look at each component and make sure that that particular leg of this uh, is financially uh, viable and stable. You know, I just think sometimes we kind of rush to judgment because somebody wants something. And I think the most critical thing, and I'm going to speak very favorably of Caltrans, they have told us and told us and told us over the years that they do not have the kind of money to uh, do the um, maintenance on their roads. I was in San Diego last weekend and I was really surprised that some of the areas there that really need rehab and we're hearing from Ryan and everyone, get us some additional money or our <coughs> infrastructure is really in trouble. So we have to hold that into this and that's certainly uh, where we have a partnership as we look at all this. But you know, I, I'm just saying be cautious with regards to the 73. Because we know that it's been uh, it's been on life support a couple of times. Chamber, um, like to speak. So I have two quick comments. One, maybe I can address the, the cost of the connector. Uh, that is assumed in alternative three in the total cost that you see in the new scheme. Uh, the, the incremental cost of that connector is also paid for by toll revenue. Um, where alternative two, which was the two lane alternative, did not have a revenue generating option. So that was the struggle where how do you find a $100 million um, extra revenue building? And so I wanted to make that, that distinction. So alternative three does include the connector um, and the, it's paid for by toll revenue. Um, but who's this like? OCTAs four or five. Okay. Yeah, the department's four or five. From the OCTAs. Right. Um, I'd also like to, to add one more thing. When we talk about success of the toll roads in South Orange County, um, what we hear a lot in the media is, is they haven't been in success because they're not meeting their financial obligations. Um, I would argue, depending on how you look at it, I'm in the mobility business. We are all in the mobility business. And the toll roads in South Orange <coughs> County, in my uh, professional opinion, has been an overwhelming success in improving mobility in South Orange County. Um, I cannot imagine what the I-5 and the 4-5 would look like in the arterials in South Orange County without the 241, the 70, and the 70. So I want to make that clear that we should be proud of that success. Um, being able to pay back the bondholders is certainly something that we need to strive for. But we are successful in mobility improvements in South Orange County. And let's all remind everybody that when we have a chance. Thank you. Dr. Hack. Yeah. <coughs> you know, Pat, <coughs> pardon me. Pat makes a great point. The point is people have to look at this as a totality. 
There's demographics that are shifting and will change. The correct question of who rides our roads has always been based on the fact that we have a very high level of people, income levels, to, to pay one of the most expensive short rides there is. Now people will come up from the south, from down in San Diego or happy. They can bypass us because if you look at the totality and you're saying you're riding for 25 bucks, well, that's a big slot. And maybe people will say to themselves, no, I think I'm going to go somewhere else. And those are the kinds of questions that really should be on the table. It's not simply, you know, making the number and, and, and multiplying it because, in effect, there is a demographic shift. And if it occurs, lots of people will say, geez, that's a totality I can't face. I think that's what we're asking to see if that is in the calculation. So, while I think we need more information, I think we're going in the right direction to generate that information. Yes, Dr. Yes, Reardon. Um, so, when, if the if the meeting for OCTA is December 9th, do we have to have some, you're, you're shaking your head, you know what I'm going to ask? Yes. Okay. Okay. okay, so answer my question. And well, ask. I think what we're doing is we've had two supervisors who will participate hands on in that decision, or minds on as the case might be, and they have asked for additional information to help them as they evaluate the alternatives. So we're putting on both Pat and Pi to represent us. No, no, we're providing, they have asked for additional information that we are generating as to the impact it will have here. Okay. They, they're just looking for additional data. Am I correct? Uh, well, so, well, can I ask one an additional question? So that means then the decision that will be made on the 9th by OCTA <laughs> will not include anything else from TCA other than Stantex data and their formulas and all that. We're not going to be weighing in on any of these alternatives. Is that correct? We have weighed in on, in, on regardless of the alternative or the, connected. The connected. Correct. Yes. But not not specifically that any of the alternatives. <coughs> okay, Todd, did you want to say something? No. Okay. Right. Any further comments? I have, second, I have a second item for the uh, yes, thank you. board. Thank you, Dave. Um, I just want to go over briefly. Um, we had a legislative ad hoc committee, which some of you sit on, and I wanted, uh, because of the timing of the legislative session coming in January, I wanted to give the rest of you a quick briefing on the, on the items that we talked about that we're thinking about. Uh, at least exploring or proposing to the state legislature and to the U.S. Congress. Can you put that in the picture? And Harvey, if you could get up to the, I'll, I'll do the, the initial run through here. If you have any detailed questions, I've got Harvey to help me out. Uh, at the state level, well, one of the ones we want to look into is the idea of, of getting authority to increase the speed on our roads. Uh, this is based on an assumption that we're, we're Doing research on right now that our roads are unbelievably safe um, and that a, an increased speed would um, not in any way jeopardize that and in fact would um, <coughs> perhaps um, uh, actually make them even more attractive to the riding public because our job is to get as many people to use our roads as possible not only for our financial health but in terms of getting as many people off of the congested 405 I-555. So we want to look at that, and that'll obviously take coordination with Caltrans, the California Highway Patrol, and others. The second one is we want to look at this dealer plate issuance issue. As you know right now, if you buy a new car, by the time you get your plates from DMV, it could be uh, six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks. So in the meantime, you get a paper, effect, effectively a paper plate that you may put in the front of the dash or what have you. We can't, we can't pick up who's got the car during that period of time. And, and that's not only true for us, but all the other toll agencies in the state. And that costs us over $2 million a year. Well, it's not an insignificant item. Uh, this has been looked at by the Metropolitan Transportation Commission in the Bay Area. They're concerned about it and others. Proposals have been made in the past. But my understanding is they haven't been done in a cooperative fashion with the Car Dealers Association. So we've had some initial meetings with some of them and want to sit down with them and find a way 
to identify their concerns and, and their issues with this and see if we can find a way that's a win-win. So that's the second one. The third one is, uh, Ryan and I have talked about this, um, I'm a just a believer, it shows my age, I guess, but I, I, I love Burma Shade Shade Man. Do you remember those on the highways? We had seven in a row. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and, the, and the message on that from a sales and marketing standpoint is you have to hear something seven times before you actually get it. And then people are moving too quickly. So although our changeable message signs, when I say ours, Caltrans and as well as our own that are on the roads today. They're so limited. If you're going by at 65 miles an hour and you just happen to be looking the other way at the time, you miss it. And that's the only sign that tells you about an option in front of you on which road to take. So uh, we'd like to explore the idea of getting additional signage out there in a way that uh, meets Caltrans's um, standards and what have you, but provides the riding public with better information. Or, for example, uh, today, I don't know if you when you came in, but you may have noticed the uh, congestion on the 133 South to get on the 405 North. Uh, well, just providing information, changeable message signs out there to say there's congestion at this particular point in time, you might want to get off of Miranda. People can choose what they want to do, but give them that information. Uh, the final one on the state level is the text messaging issue. This is, again, providing information to our customers of what's happening on the roads on a real-time basis through texting and, and they, obviously this has to be done carefully so that it's not a safety issue and it also has to be done carefully from a privacy standpoint. So we're looking at uh, talking to appropriate people. We are. Um, this basically has to do with Smidian's bill two years ago that was SB uh, 1268 and it was dealing with privacy issues. And basically, um, they require us to um, ask our customers to opt in if they want marketing materials rather than opting out. Um, and we've been doing that. And what we want to do is have a, a provision that we can have them opt out, opt into without having to first opt out of it um, so that they can receive marketing materials, or not marketing materials, so they can receive text messages. And right now, we don't have that ability to um, have them opt out. Um, they have to actually opt into it, which makes it a problem for us to send text messages. So for public service announcements, we want them to have to um, opt out of the provision that they receive messages for safety purposes and for public service announcements. Mr. Chairman? Yes. So what's the, I, I'd like to have a discussion about that, not today, we, we take a lot of time, but I'm not really an opt-out presumptive guy. I think you should have to opt-in to, you know, and I think we should talk about that before that's a formal position of this agency. I mean, if I understand it, I'm not sure I, I got the expression, but my understanding is you want to pursue where you presumptively get it and then you would have to affirmatively opt-out. As Correct. opposed to you, uh, you ask permit, you give your permission to get the information, mm -hmm. and so you want to reverse the presumption. Exactly. Yeah, I would ask, don't we have to adopt the legislative platform? Yeah, this, uh, the, the uh, ad hoc legislative committee will bring to this board a final. So we'll see that. Right. This is just background information of what we're considering. Got it. Mm -hmm. right. And at the Fed, excuse me, question. Go ahead and help on that. At the federal level, um, four items. One is continuing to pursue environmental streamlining. Uh, Peter Bufa is here. I think the author of uh, uh, a lot of work that OCTA did in the last couple of years on this issue, and there were a lot of improvements in the in the MAP 21 bill on this point, but there's, there's more to be done here. Uh, so continuing that effort. The second item here is trying to see if there's a way of, um, of uh, highlighting the importance of emergency routes, alternative routes, and key corridors, whether it be for freight, or emergency conditions such as fires, tsunamis, nuclear problems, etc. Because um, obviously the alternative I-5 issue, that's a critical one. Anybody that uh, was around when the, that accident occurred, what, say two weeks ago, when I-5 stopped, I mean, there was nowhere for anybody to go. So there's got to be some uh, focus on that. And that's the second one. And then the third one is, Amendments to TIFIA, um, if we plan, if, if we should plan to use that financing uh, 
in the vice of the future. Uh, there are several pieces of that that, that if amended would be more helpful for us. Right now, for example, it cannot be used for refinancing. Uh, it can, but they've got a policy issue not to do it for that purpose. Uh, I've got arguments on why we think. Secondly, uh, right now, uh, they typically can only be used when it's uh, for, for uh, projects that are investment grade. I've got arguments on why it should be used for projects that aren't investment grade. So uh, there are a few of those types of things. And then finally, totally the interstate. Um, just right now, uh, you know, if the federal government is not prepared to step up to the plate to increase funding for transportation infrastructure through whatever means, whether it be gas tax, <coughs> et cetera, if they're not, they're effectively devolving that responsibility to the regional and local levels. In that case, why don't they give us, when I say us, the state and the regions, the authority to toll and fight the politics at the local level? So that's sort of the last issue. <coughs> uh, question about the first uh, state initiatives. Uh, are we reviewing? Uh, other states' initiatives that have been successful, for instance, the first one, which increasing speed limit. Yes, we are going to do. We haven't started that, but we are doing the research so that we can see if other states have done anything like that. Obviously, we would have to work with CHP and Caltrans on anything that we do with that, because as Neil pointed out, safety is the biggest concern we have. So you're talking about maybe five mile increase, not creating a German auto line. <laughs> Right, well, Neil had suggested 75 to 80 miles per hour as a possibility, and starting high. Oh, it is a German auto <laughs> Okay. All right, Ken, then, this is entertaining, but we need to move on. Mr. Can I just clarify, these initiatives, we're, you're not asking us to adopt anything today. These are things that you're going to be looking into and bringing back to us at some level, and we can discuss at the time. Absolutely. Okay, because I think there's a number of these that, that lots of us will have some comment on. So yeah, as long as this is just what you're thinking about, that's fine. Yes, and I would hope that the legislative ad hoc, ad hoc then would look at, it appears to be counterintuitive to increase speed and then also increase signage. I, you know, call me crazy, yeah, but there's, <laughs> and, and texting, I, you know, all of these things, I, you know, if they're, if they're standalone <laughs> items and they're, we're looking to get one, of the three, maybe, but you got to put them together. And if you go past bit. 80, you get a text. That you're going, right. If you go past 80, you get a text that you're going too fast. <laughs> My car blows up. <laughs> all right, all right, I totally lost control. <laughs> all right, thank you. We will move on to my report, and I have no report. <laughs> thank you, Raj. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I had an hour one, but I'm going to forgive it. Um, so we're now going to go to joint board session. Director Mains. Chair, is there a, a moment for one new piece of new business? I just had one housekeeping item to bring up. Um, regarding the, the presentation and the format of the minutes, um, I just I noticed that our minutes are close to transcription minutes when it comes to board comments. And that is not what I get on any of the other things that I serve on. We usually have summary minutes. Um, and I think it'd, be, it'd serve the public better to, to do a summary minute instead of transcription style minutes. There are recordings made if people want to hear the exact comments, but I think that would dramatically cut down staff work and also would provide a more clear presentation. So I would just like to see if this, I, I'd make a motion to that effect if that's appropriate at this time. I'm not sure whether it's appropriate or not. I, I think that you can just work with staff and, uh, and we can look at that. Uh, okay, all right, I'm happy with that. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right, joint board. We're now going to invite the Foothill Eastern Board to come to the dais. They will convene their meeting, and then once they convene their meeting... Well, now we'll move on to item number two. We have a joint board meeting session. We'll begin with the monthly traffic and revenue report. If we could have Mr. Gallagher present, please. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I have your monthly uh, your traffic and revenue report. I believe you've all received a written communication from the finance department. I'll give you the summary. Uh, for Foothill Eastern, transactions are up. Um, and remember, what we're looking to see here is that the red line is higher than the blue line is so that we go across um, this. And, and in, and in uh, both cases, for Foothill and for San Joaquin, uh, that's the case that is above, above projections. Uh, if we can flip through the transactions, revenue, of course, is above. Um, and and um, give you the numbers in just a second. San Joaquin uh, above transactions and certainly above revenue. That's all good news. 
Um, <clears throat> so not uh, on, on one of the slides, but um, for transactions, um, which, I, which I think make, make the most sense to sort of watch as we go, go through time, you see to make revenue go up and down with toll rates. So, the year-on-year change for Foothill um, for this month is 2.2 percent, and and the year-on-year the year-on-year uh, from the from from today to what we, we planned in the budget is about 2.6 percent positive for Foothill transactions. For San Joaquin, the numbers are a little bit better. Transactions year-on-year from you know from October this year to October last year plus 4.3 percent. That's pretty good news. Um, and to budget, um, it's 6.4% positive. So pretty, pretty good news kind of across the board. The other thing I would point out is that in terms of new accounts that are coming into um, that we that we sign up, um, we typically get historically about 3,000, maybe 32, 3,300 new accounts each month. In October, we got 5,100 new accounts. A lot of this has to be. You'll hear about this a little bit later on. Um, as part of our marketing presentation that, that Lisa and Lisa will do. Um, so it's about 4.9% improvement year on year on accounts. When people sign up for an account, <coughs> that's an indication they're going to use the toll roads. That's a pretty kind of good news. All these things are sort of going together. Um, and uh, it's an indication that, to us, that, uh, at least to me anyway, that um, um, people are aware of the toll roads are coming in, signing up, they're getting transponders, and we as we keep that going over, and you'll see this in terms of schedule for all electronic tolls, we keep that going over the winter um, and into the spring will we'll turn out, I think, actually pretty nicely. Um, so um, there's one other item. I, oh, there's a couple of other slides. There's a couple slides that, um, that Amy and the CEO have been using um, in their presentations um, with the with bond that houses um, and the underwriters. There are new underwriters, but they're reading agencies, right? Um, and Stantec, your uh, your consultants have have um, put these these numbers together. So, in annual growth in the study year, which is pretty large, about eighty one thousand new jobs per year. The last data I saw for Orange County, year on year, plus thirty two thousand jobs this year to last year. But pretty good news. And that I think is is a key indicator of why traffic is going up. Additionally. Um, that you see on here is that you know go back. It's the one other highlighted faster faster employment growth um, in Orange River and San Bernardino counties. Part of the study here is Los Angeles County, but you know this is pretty good news um, in terms of households. Um, also households going up, but interestingly, uh, the rate of new jobs per household um, is is increasing over time. So jobs um, accounts. Transponders, <coughs> traffic, these things are in my head are all, uh, are all lining up. I think those are the key reasons why we see our, our traffic and our revenue going up. Um, the only caution I would give you on all this is not to, not to fall in love with these numbers too much because next year you know, we're going to have sort of, we'll have different percentage rates because we'll be working against all this good news this year. Right? Uh, that's my traffic and revenue report for this month. Might it also be a factor that we're stepping up our marketing and, and we're out there uh, um, securing uh, pre, or uh, called pre activity for all electronic tolling, but that's increasing the awareness and usage in general right now today. We are, and, and, and uh, I think next up, I think uh, we're going to tell you, uh, I'll tell you all about kind of where we are with all electronic tolling. Which will take me about 10 seconds, and then Lisa and Lisa will tell you all about our marketing program. Is that next? It's coming up soon. Okay. Next slide. Any, any uh, questions of uh, Jim's presentation from uh, Mr. San Joaquin? Yeah. One, one additional fact that I would add is the number of building permits in, in the county at the end of September equaled the total number of building permits in the entire year last year. So there's obviously economic activity occurring here, and we're getting the benefit of that. Of course, we make that point when we talk to the raising houses. It must be because of the quality of supervisors that we have in town. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Okay, item number, uh, let's see, next time is uh, customer focus. 
have a presentation with Jim Gallagher and Lisa Tejas. <laughs> yeah, uh, there are a couple of introductory um, remarks I want to make about the project itself, and I'll turn over to Lisa so we can go to the next. Um, we're um, uh, on uh, Tuesday evening next. Uh, we will start the construction and installation process for all electronic tolling. First Plaza is Irvine Ranch North. Um, and uh, the civil work will be done Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night, and Friday through uh, Sunday. We'll tear down all the equipment that's there, put up all the new equipment, get it all running by Friday, uh, by Monday morning at 0500, um, and, uh, and turn the road over. During that period of time, um, we will be uh, moving all the traffic through the cash lane. So, real very quickly, we've got 26 main lines to do, 28 main line lanes, uh, 28 ramp lanes, Windy Ridge and Catalina Views. We'll do special treatments uh, for truck open or toll lanes later on in the program and ramp cash lane conversions. Um, here's a very quick idea of where all these things are, when all these things are going to happen in terms of where we're going to be at each plaza. We'll keep you up to date so sort of as we go through here. We're going to do a couple, one plaza in November, um, one plaza in December, and then in, because we've got to hop over the holidays and things like that, we don't want to be working um, through some of the holiday seasons. And then January, February, every weekend, we'll be out doing plazas. And then March, April, we'll be doing all the cash lanes. Uh, and um, if, <coughs> if you, you see there, May, end of, end of uh, cash collection, all electronic tolling, the date we have, we are all working to right now is May the 7th. So um, keep us on pretty much right on, on target for where we want it to be. And absent, um, absent any rain happening this winter, we we'll, should make that then. We're all ready to do all these things. I think we can flip on to the next uh, thing. Ah, um, who wants to do something? Okay, so here is um, here's a, what we're going to do to close the main line. This happens to be Orange Grove. We'll stripe it out, put uh, put the candlesticks up in a barrier across the cash uh, area, at, and when we go to all the front tolling. The next uh, location happens to be uh, a ramp closure, and here um, we'll stripe out the cash side. Put up the candlestick delineators, um, put the barrier up on the catch lane, put a new sign uh, up on top of the um, um, plaza there, the ramp plaza there, that, that essentially brings, uh, tells people that you, you pay with Fast Track or with an express account or pay at the tollroads.com. Uh, so um, we've talked a lot about the truck open road toll lanes and at the two plazas, Windy Ridge and Catalina View, where there are grades going up to the to these uh, plazas, we have to provide a truck a truck lane to get up the hill, and then we we're going to take the truck right through. So we'll take out a center boot, delineators, and candlesticks, as I, uh, 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 and stripe it out, um, and that and hang the new equipment right over that lane. That'll be the truck open road toll lane. Um, and then now here's the, here's the signs that we were asking about a little earlier <clears throat> these are on the um, these are on the there's three signs uh, overhead large that, that as you approach each of the main lines whole plazas so on the top of the sign instructions uh, invitation to pay by fast track or new uh, express accounts or at the tollroads.com we've had some we presented all this to the to the uh, toll operations committee yesterday we have some suggestions about maybe taking some of the signs that are on the, the uh, sides of the road there about video tolling enforcement and moving those to another place. We're going to take all that under consideration. Um, but this, this uses the, uh, the new um, manual uniform traffic control device uh, standards uh, incorporating the color purple. And you will, you'll see the color purple across a lot of our signing. Um, so as we go forward, the next is the second sign that again has the purple banner at the top, instructions to pay, and a thank you for choosing the toll roads. And then the instructions for uh, the truck open road toll lane, of course, are in, in standard instructional language. The last um, is after the toll point. <clears throat> These are, you have to be careful, these are not the scale. Right? Um, the, yeah, right. the, See, these are the signs I didn't know you guys were so happy about. So you said, "Oh yeah." No <laughs> so, um, uh, 
this again is a rendition of the Burma shape approach that the CEO was, was talking about. But it, what, it's, what we're trying to impart to people here is no fast track, no express account, fine. Use one time toll, and that's our that's our our way of allowing people to pay by license plate by simply contacting us, telephone, website, uh, mobile application, through the interactive voice. Um, and we say that a couple of times so that people are, you will see the message, what to do, and then to read it. Uh, I think that's the last. Okay, so um, for these signs, we're working, I think as, as Kelsey Anderson um, indicated, we're working to get headquarters uh, concurrent this month. We'll get the engineering, the redesigns, of the, the plans done, you get the shop drawings, et cetera, all preparatory to having these available and ready for installation in April, which comports with the overall schedule for the program. I think that's all I have. Questions? Uh, can you go back up the slides to the uh, over, overhead sign? Sure. Not the firm shape, those. Sure. Is there anything, it was thought given to a more primitive, like a symbol of a cash that we don't take cash in any big graphic, makes it abundantly clear there is no more cash taking. Uh, on this. Yes. And that's Sorry? Communicates it clearly? Yes, on the entrances to the. That was on, the on the entrances to the. Um, um, on ramp entrances and on the freeway interchanges, there'll be uh, signs indicating no cash. Right. Do we have the. Uh, a slide that and, and it's a very simple white white field black rubber standard sign. But Jim, just go back over because this is going to be something that at our council meetings we're going to need to really start talking about even more than before. So um, the picture is going to be taken of the license plate, correct? If it, if I don't have a fast track, then. The option is that if I if I get on the toll road and I can't pay cash, my license plate's going to be taken a photograph of. Is that right? Yes, but but go ahead. But, no, well, go first ahead. of all, um, what 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 we're going to drive through is to have people sign up for a license plate account. Mm -hmm. There's three styles of license plate account: prepaid, pay as you go, and invoice. And for those people, really, really, truly infrequent users, um, the one-time toll. So, and then the technology that's used to, to make all that go is video, correct? So, somebody- if you have an account. Right, if somebody doesn't have an account though, then- One time toll. One time toll. Right. But they're going to get a bill? How are they gonna pay that? Bill. They have to take action to, to, um, to contact us and, and uh, let us, give us their license plate from which we'll be able to derive their toll, let them know what the, what the payment requirement is. But we know from others that we've contacted, and we've been in contact with I and Lisa and others here uh, across the country, is that um, people who went for sort of, oh, just come and drive and we'll find you and bill you through your license plate, um, have rooms the size of this one full of paper. And, and uh, you know, bills going in and going out and notices going back and forth and crossing in the mail, <coughs> a huge uh, mess. Um, and people are still working through those things and then actually heading our way. Lisa, you want to say something? Yes. <laughs> I think this is a, a perfect transition into the marketing campaign. Um, and so some, a few of the board members here have heard the presentation because we are going out to the uh, board. Yes. You said that some of the questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I so I will we'll address your question when we, um, under the marketing component. I, I'm a very patient person. Not today. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Okay, did you start the marketing? Yes, sir. Thank you. I, I guess I'm going to go to the other end of the spectrum from a financial standpoint, pragmatic. How much, and I should not know this question, but I don't, how much of the tolls currently are being paid in cash? About 16% 16, 16 of transactions, about 19, 20% of revenue. Okay, so my instincts would say one of the things we need to really think about when we're looking at our growth numbers next year is plan on being about 20% at risk because I, I there's lots of good people out there, but there's lots of people that will never bother. And unless your collection, maybe you have a plan to pursue, and I know we've had mixed results, I guess I'll say to be polite on pursuit. Um, I just think we need to really think that part of it through because there isn't anybody 
or there are a lot of people that are going to think they're going to do it and then they get home hopefully they're not doing it while they're driving and um, I just think you're going to put a, a, a chunk at risk there's no way around it there's just something to plan for because uh, I you can advertise it all you want we have great marketing and all that stuff and human condition is a human condition and what was that website uh, okay yeah I'll get to that when I get home and then dinner's on and oh gosh I meant to do that and, you know, hopefully a lot of people do, but I just don't think it's going to be. I think you'd be lucky to get 50 percent, maybe maybe 60 percent of the max of of those people that have to go do that activity to pay. Um, um, given that we have a, a license plate, we will we will identify the registered owner of the vehicle and send that registered owner of the vehicle a, a violation notice with, after 48 hours of, the, of time, which we allow people to uh, pay their toll. I think, that just some, uh, some, I think that part of it maybe warrants some additional discussion as we move forward because you could also have an unintended consequence of a negative connotation of using the roads that you wouldn't want to have when you're trying to debut a new service. So just something to think about. I don't want to I belabor it today, but that's my two cents worth. No pun intended. Jim, are you having a, uh, implementing a grace period to get people transitioned properly without getting a violation notice right you'll, you'll hear you'll hear all of the marketing activities that, that are planned here in, in just a moment and they and they start relatively soon um, and and uh, uh, we'll have a four month transitional period uh, between January and May to get people signed up um, and we think that uh, given the effectiveness of the DOC, <laughs> of our campaigns and promotions, we're going to reach a lot of people. We've got an objective um, that we, we want to reach and, and certainly surpass. You'll see that in a moment. Great, thank you. Additional questions, board members? Yes, Director Nelson. But just a quick comment, Mark. Re remember that when we eliminate the cash tolling, we eliminate the cost of all the toll takers. So if we actually got only 50%, we're probably rolling it at that point because we don't have the expense anymore. But my question was specific. You had some slides on uh, removing the toll booths. And you know, my concerns, having litigated some cases dealing with highways and things, is obstacles in highways become targets, whether people are tired or drunk or whatever the reason is. Um, the federal highway standards talk about having to design uh, highways, assuming that drunk drivers and other people will veer off the road. And those striping scenarios and the rails and things make me nervous. I mean, I realize if you're supposed to come to a stop at those, then the speed's different. But if you're rolling through those sections at, you know, at, at full speed, um, is someone from a traffic engineering standpoint looked at the safety aspect of that and thinks that that's better than, say, for example, just removing the toll so there's no target to run into mm -hmm. those, those boots. We, we did take one out. There's a 10 foot shoulder. I know. Right I saw the slide. Left, five foot on the other and a 12 foot lane. Um, the first time someone's killed running into one of those boots, uh, these words are going to sort of ring true. I mean, putting rails and booths around people going 65 miles an hour as opposed to people coming to a stop is a whole different issue. And I just feel a lot better with those toll booths being removed or, or certainly a much wider shop than threading the needle, uh, particularly if you got trucks and things going through there. Uh, I, I'm not a traffic engineer, but uh, there was a prior slide with a rail now that was covering, um, it's like a K rail that was gonna cover part of the closed lane and stripes and, and we just, we all see it. Uh, traffic diversion equipment in our cities, yeah, that was the one. I mean, that's, that's an accident waiting for a place to happen. And that, that slide right there, you, you, you know, you're just going to see the Orange County Register photo of somebody wrapped around that toll booth. We will, um, I'm not a traffic engineer either, but we'll pick it up with the traffic engineers and safety engineers and, and talk with Caltrans again about it. Um, the design is done by professional um, civil and traffic engineers and it's approved. Are, are we trying to hang on to these booths for any particular reason? Or is well, it, no, we just try to avoid the cost of removing them? A couple of reasons. That's one. Um, also, um, the cost of the installation would go up significantly from beyond where it is today. The, the booths have equipment in them. Some of them do. And the mainline clause is typically there's a um, there's a tunnel underneath of it with equipment and communication gear and, and, and such. And there are stairway uh, uh, egress 
we actually locate, we put the lane where it is because there's no stairway there, it's adjacent. Um, and um, you know, to do, um, uh, to, in order to use the tunnel and continue to use the tunnel, and we think we should, uh, we have to provide egress. And that's, you know, there's still, you know, a challenge, the design challenge, and a cost to do that. Okay. Uh, but so, yes, it's been all considered. Um, this is our best, best considered uh, approach to this job. I could just make a desperate plea that somebody relook at those distances. We'll do that. Sure. I mean, and, and, and I would encourage you contact some of the plaintiff's attorneys, Chase and Bizon, or some of the people that make millions every year suing Caltrans and other agencies on road conditions, and ask the experts that they hire every single trial. The Harry Creepers of the world, ask them what they think of this and how they take it apart. Yes, his name's Harry Creeper. Uh, but but we'd be wise, go ask them in advance to critique this because you know one carload of people ends up attached to this thing, uh, the price tag is gonna be enormous. Yes, thank you. Could we put the slide up of the, the sign that not this one, the other one that has, thank you for the toll booth, and then the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the overhead, right? Yeah. I think go down one. My, my, yeah, the number one to me, this is just so busy. And I, the, the, just my personal opinion, the issue of thank you for choosing the toll road, I think that's great, but I could see that as a sign on the side. To me, the most important thing that we're going to be dealing with is people, I mean, just from my perspective, I would get on a road and not, well, what happened to the, the booth is gonna be there, but why Why can't I pay? Especially people that have not, even though we have this great marketing <coughs> plan, and I'm sure be very successful. But it, to me, I agree with Director Karuk. I think something, because that's the main thing that's going on here, that we have to have something that says, uh, similar to, you know, no more cash, don't be fined, call the tow road or something. To me, that's the priority for at least the first six months, and then maybe we can put back up something, thank you for choosing the toll roads. But that message is not important at this particular time when we kick this off. To me, it's really, we're not accepting cash anymore, and having the booze there, as Director Nelson's saying, I think even that's gonna confuse people, because people are gonna think, oh, the booze are still there, where do I take my money? And you don't want people driving maybe 80 miles an hour and not understanding what's going on. So to me, just my personal opinion, I think the signage has to deal with the cash issue, even if it's a removable sign after six months, but I think people need to know, not, oh, you know, I, I just don't think our signage says anything really about, you know, it says express account, but people aren't gonna understand going that fast, what do I do, what do I pay, are they gonna come after me, is the police gonna chase me down, you know, I, I, I don't know, maybe I just don't feel the message is really clear. Do we talk about that in, in the subcommittee meetings here? Or? We, we have, and we've, we've thought about all the things, but we'll, you know, I think that's a good point that we'll, we'll include that in our... At least the first, first couple step. of months, even if it's movable, something. Sure. So I don't know how, what kind of... Don't, don't worry about adding to it, but, you know, I think your point is, is well taken, and we'll, we'll see what we can do with it. I would add to that, uh, Jim, so one thought would be because the toll booth is still there, there might even need to be a sign that says do not stop. There are. Okay. All right. Why don't we, uh, if there are any further questions, why don't we have Lisa proceed with her part of the presentation? I just want to point out on the signs, you're seeing just uh, pieces of the signs. There are actually three signs leading up to the red line plaza that has the the messaging I think you're talking about. So I think to see all the pieces together is part of it. We can show that to you in the future. So um, quickly, I wanted to, uh, a couple months ago, we gave a, a presentation on the marketing campaign for the agencies and said we'd come back to you as we were developing how we're gonna deal with um, educating and transitioning into the uh, all electronic tolling uh, component. So I'm gonna ask Lisa Gans to come up to give you an overview. It's a shortened presentation than we gave yesterday to the operations committee. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> so um, this is a shortened presentation and it'll, just provide a quick update of what is going on with the all electronic tolling uh, currently as well as in the future. 
you all have seen the slide before, uh, but we've introduced the all electronic tolling campaign as a three phased approach. And uh, phase one started in July uh, as our fiscal year started and will run through December. And the objective of that uh, phase is really to launch fast track accounts and to generate more fast track accounts because we don't have the uh, express accounts open at that point. So phase two will uh, be starting in, Jan in January when we launch the express account options. And we do have that, uh, we'll call it sort of like a soft period of education uh, between January and May um, for much of the conversion to, the, uh, to uh, launch all electronic tolling mm -hmm. and really to promote the express account as another option. And then phase three begins in May um, when cash goes away and the ongoing uh, awareness and account acquisition is really the goal during that period. So to give you a quick update of what we've been doing, we are in the middle of uh, phase one right now. We started the campaign in July and August launching Lane and um, then in September, October and November we converted to uh, promote the mobile app uh, technology of being able to sign up uh, an account via the mobile app and we gave, gave an incentive to sign up with a fast track account uh, via the mobile app. So Jim went through the revenue and transaction numbers. We've seen positive growth. We've seen account growth uh, since July, but really bumped up in the last couple of months. We were able to uh, identify the number of accounts that have been opened up through the promotion, and you'll see in green in September it was 17%, and October was 20%. So we have seen some, um, that's positive news re related to the advertising campaign and all the things that are going on from an awareness level. Moving into phase two, um, we move into that with uh, sort of a different objective. Um, this, as Jim was talking about, is really the awareness and education campaign where we need to spread the word that we are going cashless um, and also to um, announce the new uh, new ways to pay. You know, it's easy, it's fast, um, making sure that pretty much everybody in the community knows what's going on with the conversion. Um, conversion is another key priority for us in terms of trying to generate uh, accounts. We have a, a goal of 70,000 new express accounts based on our traffic and revenue studies. Um, in terms of meeting our revenue projections for the for the year, but um, obviously we're going to be trying to generate more accounts than that. So um, the other um, thing that I wanted to go into was we we put together what we're calling a, a marketing and a PR toolbox, and this is just an abbreviated version of all the different elements that we'll be working with at different times. So one of the things that we'll be working with is paid media. The overall objective there is just really make sure that everybody knows what's going on. We're gonna focus on you know, high awareness, high impressions, um, uh, vehicles that uh, are generate a lot of impressions. And we're hitting the Orange County Inland Empire and the Los Angeles market. We'll target uh, general market and Hispanic audiences and just really try to make sure that everybody knows of the, um, the conversion. Uh, we are in the middle of updating our website right now. We know the website is, is the primary vehicle that people use to sign up for an account. And I'll just give you a quick snapshot of, of that. Um, this will be live starting in December. And we've made some significant changes to the, the website, trying to make it a little bit easier for people to, um, to sign up um, from a sales perspective. And we've restructured and, and cleaned up a lot of the elements to make it um, a little bit easier to navigate through if you're an existing fast track account holder as well as um, um, as well as the other uh, key elements. It's, it's missing right now for some reason on that little space that's blank, but that is actually a little one-time toll section. I'm not sure why it's not showing up right now. We're in the middle of testing it, so <laughs> that, that is one of the things that we need to look into. Um, but the quick links will uh, hopefully help people that maybe one-time toll users be able to um, quickly uh, go into uh, paying for an account with one time, uh, paying a one-time toll or adding a vehicle and things like that. Um, so if we go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, we are producing uh, various educational videos that are pertaining to how to pay a one-time toll, which account is right for me, um, general awareness on how to use the roads. We've got a, a number of different items that we're developing for collateral pieces, a really extensive brochure that explains all electronic tolling and um, express accounts, rate card that will be a, a very extensive, so we know that some of, the, some of the questions that people are asking is, I don't, I don't understand how much I have to pay. Um, so this will be a really comprehensive piece on really how to use the roads. Um, the other things are statement stuffers, toll attendant flyers uh, to target our cash users, and um, little one-time toll business cards. 
Social media will be a major element, um, and as well as promotional uh, items like thirty dollars promotion to generate traffic. Um, <laughs> yes, and quickly, we will be um, supporting all of the paid media components with um, public relations and outreach. So we'll be uh, promoting the promotions through um, through the um, press media. Um, we are working on issue management. Certainly, we are aware. We work with the other agencies across the country that have switched over to all electronic tolling and know the concerns and issues that have come up and how to manage those. Um, we've launched a speakers bureau, and we will continue to do that, um, as well as the planned events. So, when the signs are installed, when we launch the all uh, trust accounts, and getting media out for special events and also uh, booths and outreach, and also construction outreach, so informing both the people who are driving the roads about some changes to their drive or detours, as well as neighbors that are near the road that may hear noise. Um, I we did put one of our show and tell items, this is a license plate, you guys all have one in front of you, if you'd like to take it with you, it's easy to stick in a file or a briefcase. Um, it has based some basic facts about what's happening with um, the Express account. So basically this is the way you'll be able to pay uh, by taking a, license, a photo of your license plate and it has some basic facts and how people can sign up in January online for these new accounts. Yes. So the, um, there are still many fast track. 80% of our traffic today pays with fast track. 16 are paying with cash. We did research with our cash customers and asked them why they haven't signed up for fast track. Um, some of the reasons they haven't signed up is why we developed the Express account. The concerns people had is prepaying their money into an account. They had concerns about the fee. They had concerns about um, having a transponder in their car. Or they said, I just don't drive down in South Orange County very often, and so it doesn't matter. And I'll, I'll pay cash or I won't use it. So um, the Express account was designed with your license plate. There is no fee associated with two types of the accounts. There, you don't have to prepay into the account, and all you need to do it will, be, it will be to give us a credit card, your license plate number, some basic information, and then the day you drive the road, that is the day you'll be charged the toll. So if you don't drive very often, there's no reason not to have an account. The only trick is that they only will work on the 241, the 73, 261, and um, the 241. Um, they won't work on the 110 or the 91 express lanes. So. Um, they will also have a little bit of a higher toll, similar to how cash is a higher toll today than fast track. Um, so it adds more options for people that the fast track transponder isn't fitting into their home business financial model, um, more options, and uh, we're gonna be doing a big outreach campaign to the local colleges because we think this is gonna be a great way to, to kickstart people into using the toll roads. Um, and then the idea would be if you do travel all over California or Southern California, or you travel a lot and want the lowest toll, then fast track will continue to be the best um, best trip um, option for you. Any questions? Um, I think it would Director May, then Director Truth, and then Director Reardon. Okay, thanks. I just thank you very much, Madam Chair. I wanted to follow up briefly on the comment that uh, Director Murphy made earlier about the violations and the holiday period, and how will that work? Do you have any um, insight? Yeah, so there will be a time period. I think it's been designed and how long it will be. So. What happens is if you drive on the road and you don't have either a fast truck account or an express account, you'll need to either go online or go through an app to post pay within 48 hours of your toll. And that will stop the violation process in its tracks. And so you won't get a violation notice. If you don't stop it, then you'll end up getting a violation notice. And so we're looking at having a, a, a wave, a period of time where that violation notice, if you get it, will be really an education, will inform you, will ask just for the toll, not the fee and then um, have some education information about how to sign up for an account in that material. So for a certain period of time, you'll get a letter that says, this would have been a, note, a violation, but you're not going to get a violation because we're in the implementation period, and so please go online and pay your toll, uh, and in the future, this would have been a violation. Something like that? And here's how you can sign up for an account um, if you want Okay, and how long do you think you'll be doing that? I think we're working with, working with operations on the length of time right now. Yeah, we're still working, yeah. yeah. I think that's going to be really important to making sure you don't get public backlash. So I, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Success of the media rollout depends to some degree on how people perceive new account, potential new account holders perceive Lane. Will we be doing any follow-up surveys of these new account holders, see how they react to her? I noticed there's some change in her image. We're kind of moving her from looking like she's holding a Starbucks 
pick up with a dog in a purse to someone who's more uh, intelligent. So I assume we'll be fine tuning that that look as depending on we will we will definitely be doing ongoing uh research regarding our uh, and feedback on our marketing campaign but i noticed that you she has glasses now i mean it looks like you're trying to make her look a little bit different than the first time we saw her well the idea I mean, certainly was for that she'll be able to evolve as she as to, react, to interact to the with smart friends yeah. i appreciate that <laughs> 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 Director Reardon. Yes, um, for those of us that have uh, constituents and residents in our cities and all that, Lisa, so um, what, could you be, could you start sending us something, I don't care if it's an email or whatever, and we have a blog for the city, we have, you know, a website and all that, and I will be announcing this kind of stuff continuously at the next two meetings that I, well, no, actually after that. Um, so. If you could just give us some talking points and just get us through that, and then we can give we can put it on our blog, so we can do what we can do to help um, all of our residents understand what's going on. Right, and we're really work, work keen January to really start publicizing um, and talking in the media about the program because that's when you'll actually be able to go online and sign up for one of these accounts. Right now, you physically can't do it. We do have a, a sign up, uh, give us your information, and we'll put you on a list that we're doing now with the Speakers Bureau, but our goal right now is through the holidays is to speak to the cities and some of the some major groups we're talking to um, and getting feedback. We had a great meeting with um, an organization that uh, it coordinates all the senior centers in South Orange County because there's a lot of, we're, we're not gonna go through all the parts of the presentation, but there's broad media, but there's also some target audiences we know we need to reach out to, uh, the tourism industry, um, senior community, college. There's some targeted programs we have uh, Hispanic is also a really important one. So all of those are part of the program and um, we'll be reaching out to those individuals. Just a point of clarification. So you don't really want us talking about creating, um, giving the option of an express account until January? I think you can talk about it's coming. Okay. And in, and that's this, there's a few factoids on the back of your hand, Danny Lice's plate, mm -hmm. that has the basic information that you can start talking about. We'd really love to appreciate it. If there are any groups you all have that uh, want to have a presentation or if you want to be part of that outreach, um, we can help provide additional information. We have a PowerPoint presentation that we've developed. We were in the Center of Margarita last night giving that presentation. And um, so we have a presentation if you want to be part of our, our outreach, that would be great as well. Included yeah. in Oh, included in your list, are you are you including the Chambers of Commerce? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to add. I think Rhonda's right on in terms of utilizing uh, every every city in terms of our board meetings. And there's two ways you can do that. One is to actually have you you know invite you guys to come and give a formal presentation. But it might also be nice to have um, you know uh, one or two or three chart updates that you make available to all the cities that we can in January show this kind of an update, in February this kind of an update, uh, in March invite you in, whatever. It might be nice to have a more organized program for us to communicate through our um, board meetings or council through, meetings. Through January, through May. Right. That'd be great. And we that. Something new each month. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, if I could just emphasize, the, the idea of the license plate is to give you something right now that you can hold up right. and it's kind of a right. backup of the talking points. And you can, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can sign people up now. They just can't, they can't get filled that way until January 1. But we do have flyers for everybody, for people who want to sign up in advance. So you don't have to wait to January to sign up. Yeah, and just to follow up on that sign, people that are converting from the current plan that don't use it but might have 60 or $70 in that account, are we going to refund their accounts? Right, if you close, when they if, you close, close if you decide, um, if you, now remember that the a fast track account will still be the lowest toll and will also right. allow you to drive all over right. the state. Um, but if you choose to close, um, change, you'll, that account would have to be closed and then reopened. And then I guess that's a good question about if you have a balance. It depends on what you sign up for because there is a way to have a prepaid uh, express account as well. Yeah, mine's always at about 60 or $70. Okay. And, <laughs> and I don't use it. I don't drive that much outside of San Clemente, except to come to these wonderful meetings. <laughs> yeah, I note that the, we have options that are no monthly pays on some of the yes. 
Could you distinguish between when what these options are? In other words, we normally charge two dollars a month for uh, people who use it less than a, a certain amount. You use less than twenty-five dollars per transponder on your cash account. There's a two-dollar monthly fee. Um, under the express accounts, the the prepaid. So if you you can pre do a prepay account if you want to put money into an account and have a draw like a fast track, but not have to have a transponder. There will be no monthly fee associated with that account or the charge account, which is where you. Um, put out your, you give us your credit card, and then that night you use the road, it charges your credit card. So if you don't drive the road very often, the day you use it, that's the day you'll be charged and there'll be no fee with that. If you choose an invoice, we're also offering an invoice account. We heard from our customers, they'd rather be invoiced. Um, those, there will be an invoice fee. Any further questions? Just one real quick one. Just one request on, on a future meeting since we're, we're tracking the effects of the marketing campaigns. Are we capturing or can we capture the data? I'd like to look at the new sign up six months from now. Mm -hmm. I don't know, is it more intelligent if I do this? When I put <laughs> uh, uh, we track, can we track this stuff six months? Uh, okay. no, no not for this side, right? Can we track? What I'd like to see is you sign somebody up. Six months from now, did they sign up just because they caught at the weakness of the moment and they have seventy dollars in the account, like um, my good colleague over there, or are they using it? Because to me, the business you're trying to drive is 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 somebody that signs up new and is suddenly using the thing, you know, thirty, forty, fifty dollars a month. I would assume. Yeah. So it'd be average. good to me be good to measure that if we don't have it on on this new campaign. That'd be another way to see the effectiveness of the market. And we certainly have all that data related to how fast track works, and so. The new ones people sign up for the rest accounts are they a different type of customer? Yeah, cool. Thank you. <coughs> Chairwoman, just very briefly on the educational videos, um, can you provide that to us so that we can put it on our Facebooks as oh, well yeah. so that we can get the message out? And then, as well, if you can provide that to me so I can give to my staff and possibly put it in a, as a public service announcement on um, our channel three, we can go ahead and rotate that. And so I just have to give it to my parks and rec director and they'll add it to our as a PSA. We'll do that. Additional questions? Thank you. We'll move on to contractor recognition. Good morning. Um, it's, it's my um, privilege um, to um, recognize um, one of our contractor employees. And this month, um, I, I, I will introduce to you and I want to recognize uh, Jesse Childers. Jesse is sitting in the back the room, Jesse's right there. Stand up, Jesse. Thanks. Um, <laughs> Jesse's uh, uh, the, the installation supervisor for Transcore. Um, he's been working on the toll road project since 2005. Um, started out as a technician, worked his way up, um, and uh, essentially through his, uh, his good work ethic, um, you know, his technical ability and his teamwork. And I've, I've done a few things with Jesse out in the field, um, and I've seen the results of his work. Um, I, I, I'd say he's at the top of his craft. When you see the things that he wires and, and, the, and the things that he insists upon his employees doing, it's really top, top notch. A little bit of background on Jesse, and um, is that he, he uh, served in the Marine Corps at Camp Pendleton, um, in the first Marine, uh, first maintenance battalion, um, and uh, between the, he and his son, they're, they're both in the YMCA guides program, or, or what are known as fire starters for their circle. So he does things other than work in the middle of the night here. Um, one of the reasons I, I thought it would be appropriate to, to bring Jesse here um, this month is that starting uh, next Friday, a week from tomorrow, he'll be busy every weekend. Through um, um, through June of uh, next year, um, working on installing all the toll equipment. So, um, when everything goes right in the field, Jesse did it. <laughs> if anything goes wrong, it's my my problem to deal with. Um, I really feel feel particularly lucky that uh, I've seen a lot of um, and work with a lot of, of professional individuals of of, of uh, Jesse's caliber and ability and. He's one of the top ones uh, that I've, I've uh, ever had the pleasure to work with. So he's going to be doing and supervising all the work for our electronic toll program. Um, he's been successful so far for the last five, six years on doing all these things uh, already. So I have absolute confidence that will come out of this and, and from the installation perspective. Absolutely right. So, um, Jesse, thanks very much. Now we'll move on to 
like to do employee recognition. Good morning. Today I have the pleasure of introducing and recognizing Linda Morgan. Uh, Linda is the Administrative Assistant for the Communication and Public Affairs Department. She joined, joined TCA in 2001 and it assists the entire department, not just me. It's not a traditional administration role when you work in communications. In addition to keeping our schedules straight, organizing meetings, distributing correspondence, Linda manages multiple mailing lists, conducts research, oversees mass mailings, handles event logistics, processes department invoices, compiles and distributes the, our daily clips, uh, email, and coordinates our nonprofit donation program. Lindy, Linda has a happy attitude, and that gets us through the stressful days. She knows how we tick, and exactly what we need. <laughs> I'm kind of sick, so that's why I brought the problem. Um, <laughs> she fills in the details, and she can read my mind. <laughs> Maybe she should make the present. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see me all the time. Um, it's people like Linda who work behind the scenes day in and day out that keeps TCA running. We call her the glue that keeps our department together and the oil that keeps the communication machine running. She would rather be called frosting on the cake. <laughs> and she is that too. Uh, we recognize her today and probably why I'm crying is that she's going to retire. <laughs> oh, yeah. But not until the end of February, so we'll get through the holidays because she's a great baker. Um, <laughs> And while we have been through many trying times, as you can tell, I've been through many trying times in my tenure at TCA, Linda leaving might be the toughest one. Mm -hmm. I know she's prepared some, something to say. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> it was a big surprise and a great honor to receive this recognition. And I want to thank the executive team for selecting me. And I also want to thank all of my coworkers for um, thank you for, for being there for me and for making my job easier. Thank you. And uh, with that, uh, uh, I would ask if the San Joaquin you know, board members have any further comments, needs, or urgent. Yes. Then we will adjourn yes. and allow for all these things to continue. At this time, we'll move on to public comments. We have a three minute time limit um, where members of the public may address the board of directors. Madam Clerk, do we have any requests to speak? Okay, thank you. We'll now move on to item number four, our consent calendar, items one through seven. Yes. Director Spitzer, which item are you pulling? Item number one. Right. Directors, any other items to be pulled? Okay. Do we have a motion? Second. second. A motion and a second. Okay. All in favor? All, right. All opposed? All right, we'll now move back to item number one. Director Spitzer, comments? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, just quickly on page 21 of 22 under director comments. The outlines, I changed my vote. It's uh, the reason I'm asking that entire paragraph, and I've talked to the clerk and clerk and counsel to strike it, is because technically when you change your vote during the same meeting, it's not, it doesn't get highlighted. It's, it just gets wrapped into the vote. It's properly reflected in the vote itself on the other pages, but it, it shouldn't be specially delineated, so I just had it to be stricken. I mean, I, Mr. Joseph wants a way in, but he, he agrees, or he at least in the end, he concurred with that. Presents no legal problem. Great, thank you. So I'll move the minutes with the deletion on page 21 under director comments of that. Everything from director comments down to the bottom of the page. Okay, we have a motion to approve second. item number one with those changes. We have second. second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? We'll now move on to item number five, board business. We have one item, item number eight. We could have a staff report, please, Ms. Anderson. Good morning. I'm Kelsey Anderson, Corridor Manager of Design, here to present this item for an amendment to the all electronic polling civil engineering services contract in the amount of $14,513 for this agency. 
In November 2011, the Board of Directors authorized staff to award HDR Engineering the contract for civil design services to support the all-electronic polling project. The scope of this contract includes design, preparation of construction documents, and Caltrans encroachment permitting for the civil work associated with the AAT project. The original scope for this work has been completed by HDR, and this amendment is to perform additional design services, construction plan preparation, and coordinate permit updates for the AET all electronic or for the AET alternative on road signing plan. On road signing is an important component to inform drivers on any facility. For the AET conversion in particular, the on road signing signing is critical to alert drivers to the conversion and communicate acceptable methods of payment. The TCA Sign Working Group has developed an alternative on road signing concept with more customer focused sign messaging. And the concept is ready for final design and incorporation into the construction plans once we've received Caltrans concurrence. Staff recommends the approval of this contract, excuse me, amendment, uh, and this amount can be accommodated in the FY14 AAT budget. That concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Directors, any comments, questions? Do we have a motion? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All right, that item passes. We'll now move on to our Chief Executive Officer's report. Madam Chairman, I, the most important item in the report is the status of our financial um, discussions with the rating houses and the refinancing, and maybe you can up uh, and give you a, a current status report. Thank you. I have two um, brief updates to make. Uh, the first relates to a debt service reserve fund enhancement provision that we've included in the bond indentures for the refinancing transaction. Uh, the debt service reserve fund will be funded at less than maximum annual debt service based on uh, tax provisions. So what we have done is we have added a credit enhancement provision that would add amounts to the debt service reserve fund um, based on a trigger. So uh, in a year that we didn't meet our 1.5 times coverage that we're expecting uh, to achieve, we would add 2.5 million to the debt service reserve fund. Uh, this has proven to be very helpful in our discussions with the rating agencies, which is um, brings me to my next topic. As you're all aware, um, we, you know, Yes. Yes, Dr. Spencer. Before you change that, is that, you, I know you spoke English, but <laughs> sometimes it's way above my head, I apologize. That, was that consistent, with what you talked about, was that consistent with the rainy day discussion we had, is putting money aside for the floating debt, is that what you just covered? No, that is something separate that um, we will be discussing first with the ad hoc committee and then um, bringing forth to the board. So that is something that we will be working on as a policy as opposed to something that we're actually including in the bond indentures. Okay, so okay, another time out. So then what did you just say before that? So what we have done is we have included a provision in the bond indentures that would um, enhance um, our debt service reserve fund. So right now, currently, um, the way we presented the transaction to you is the debt service reserve fund will be funded at an amount that is less than maximum annual debt service, which is the amount, the, the one year where you have the highest amount of debt service. And the reason for that is that we were restricted under um, tax law provisions to uh, funding it at an amount less than that. So what we have done though, as a credit enhancement, is added a provision that would add money to the debt service reserve fund um, up to the, the amount of maximum annual debt service. If we, um, in, in one year, in one given year, if we don't meet 1.5 times coverage, that year we would add 2.5 million to the debt service reserve fund, up to the maximum annual debt service. So we're talking about um, 25, roughly, roughly $25 million, um, potentially. So it's only if you don't meet your coverage in a year that you would add those amounts. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So with, our, thing. with the rating agencies, that has been helpful in our discussions with them. So as you're aware, we have received an investment grade rating from S&P, and we are expecting to receive a second investment grade rating um, possibly tomorrow. So um, we continue our discussions, but that, as we 
had mentioned when we presented the refinancing transaction, we need two investment grantings. So uh, we could potentially be meeting with investors towards the end of next week. So that concludes my report. Be happy to answer any questions. Questions, directors? Just a technical question. Yes. So this thing that you said you added, the board authorized you to do a certain deal within the confines of the documents we had at the last board meeting. So under what provision of that authorization were you able to make a change? Um, because this was within the provisions where we were given authorization to uh, modify the documents as well. We're not changing the structure of the deal. So what we're doing is we're just enhancing that debt service reserve um, by adding this provision. So um, I did check with our bond council to ensure that it did meet what we had presented to the board and what you've approved. So that's why we're just updating you now to let you know that we have done this, but um, we believe that it's within the authorization that you've given us. Okay, and then my other question now is, it, now that you clarified it, thank you very much, is if you reviewed the minutes, and I'm sure they did, and they're very detailed, as Director Ming had outlined before, and I commend the clerk, it, it's a, mm -hmm. it is a, basically it's blow by blow. It, it is unequivocally clear now as just adopted in the minutes that the minutes were adopted with staff recommendation, not with all the other safeguards or whatever you want to characterize them. A lot of the other potentials that we had said we were looking for almost on a rainy day time. So that did not get carried for the minutes that now have been formally adopted. The rainy day fund did not, was not part of the motion. You, you agree with that now, right? After looking at the minutes. Yes. Okay. So now what are you doing to, now, that's, I'm, I'm curious, that was one of the reasons I voted no, because I really wanted a rainy day fund, and then the motion got made to not, I think, I'm not sure if there was confusion or whatever, but the point was it wasn't in there. So now what happens, is the rainy day fund something that everybody thinks, not here, I'm saying on your side, that thinks it's a good idea and you're going to be working on that? Yes, actually we had a message sent from our CEO out to all the board after that meeting. I saw that. Yes, indicating yes, that that was our plan, was to work through the ad hoc committee to develop a policy and then bring it forth to the board. So we are working on that currently. Okay, thank you. And just to clarify, in addition to the two other items that met the same criteria, one is that we had board members come back to the rating houses, which we which we did, even though it wasn't in the motion. And the second was to keep the ad hoc committee fully informed as to progress. And we've been sending out emails and making phone calls on both of that as this has gone on. I think uh, you know Amy uh, uh, deserves uh, a, a lot of credit here. It, it, which she's not reflecting is the amount of work that's gone on since our last meeting here with the rating houses. This is not easy. And um, if you recall, we had expected the meeting houses to give us a, a, a reading, um, what, at least two weeks ago by now? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's taken two weeks longer to get the reading houses' decisions than we thought. And that's not because we weren't there giving them everything they needed, it's because of the, the back and forth. So it's not been an easy process. And as Amy indicated, we're hopeful, we can't announce anything, but we're hopeful that by the end of the week we'll have a second positive. And with that, uh, our invest, our financial advisors um, feel that we, and we have a few of them in the room here if you'd like further comments, they feel with at least two positives that we can go to the market. So that's where we're at. A lot of, a lot of work has been put in by Amy and the finance, finance team we've had here in quite difficult circumstances. So what Amy has just done is indicate in, in this process we've had to enhance our credit a little bit uh, to, 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 to satisfy some concerns that the rating houses have had, and she's just reflected what the one item is that is different from the one you saw before. But our legal advisors tell us that was small enough so that did not, uh, was not significant, the, uh, wasn't, was not outside the, the parameters she gave us in the, the meeting last time. Okay. Any additional questions or comments? Thank you. Any additional um, items to add to the CEO report? Oh, I'm sorry. The other thing I had was a review of our legislation, but I think one of the we heard that mm -hmm. earlier in the dump. I can't go through that again. Can you do it at high speed? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> That's a joke. That's a yeah, joke. Yeah, speed on that? Got it. Right. Funny, yeah. well, well, we'll now move on to director's reports. <laughs> directors, anything to report? Yes, Director Craig. Thank you. Madam Chair, I just wanted to say I was one of the two directors that went back with Chairman Bartlett and with Amy and with Neil. 
And I have to say, it was quite an experience, it was quite an education, and our finance team is some of the best people in that area. They really work very hard to make this agency look good in front of the rating agents. And if you've ever been there, and I know some of you have been, they really play poker face. They, you don't know where they're coming from, they're very friendly, they're very professional, but at the end of the day, you kind of wonder what their reaction is going to be. So it's uh, quite a show and tell. And it was an experience, and I so appreciate, and I will never forget. So, um, Neil did a fabulous job, as did Lisa and did Amy. It was, it was a good team. <laughs> With that, um, we will move on to possible closed session. Do we have a need for closed session today? Yes, Madam Chair. Closed session will be a conference with legal counsel regarding existing litigation under Government Code 54956.9, Subdivision A, the matters listed in the agenda and also regarding anticipated litigation under Government Code so, uh, Section 54956.95, Subdivision C. We do not anticipate before the last Thank you, and now recess into closed session.